<laughs> you guys welcome yeah so first as always thank you lord christ for everything and for another day of fun with math um second is i realized that none of my calculus videos cover the intermediate value theorem aka ivt and so i thought this would be a really good video uh, for that now just to make the intermediate value theorem stick in your head, I have a quick story for you, which is that, like I went to a top five school currently, according to uh, U.S. News, uh, and U.S. News is kind of biased because 20% of their um, measure for what's a top school is the school's endowment, and that's why Harvard has been consistently at the top because, well, Harvard is the richest private institution after the Vatican. Anyway, even Princeton, that's like very wealthy, uh, has a large endowment, is pretty distant as far as endowment co when compared to Harvard. Um, so, so, so that, and so my school has enough endowment, enough talented students, um, <laughs> like to like place in the top five currently this year, right? And last year and blah, blah, blah. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, if you didn't know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you go to a community college or one of these fancy schools, like in the end, you'll get the same level of education. In fact, depending on your professor, you might have a more rigorous calculus course at a community college as opposed to one of these fancy schools. Go wherever it's cheap and where they offer calculus is my advice. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, in the end, you just want the skills, right? You want to know calculus. Okay. Having said all that, uh, you know, most of the professors at these fancy schools are like pretty nice, very humble people. But on occasion, you'll get a couple of professors that are full of themselves. And so uh, there was one who taught the lowest level of calculus at my school. So at my school, there were three levels of calculus, like um, regular calc and then advanced calc and honors calc. And so I had a friend taking regular calc and he had a midterm one time where um, he did not know the intermediate value theorem. So upset that she has to teach like a regular level calculus course, his professor wrote on his paper, okay, um, if you are once below sea level and then you get to the top of a mountain, don't you have to break sea level at some point? That's pretty much what the intermediate value theorem says, but it was a very condescending way of uh, communicating that to my friend, but uh, it does make it stick. His story, him telling me that she wrote that on his paper, made it stick for me, and so that's the whole point of sharing. And uh, so let's get on with the problem. From what I just said, what the intermediate value theorem says, basically is that like, what it says is that like, well, in its full glory, it's like, on an interval AB, uh, there must be a C inside of AB so that um, F of C is inside of F of A comma F of B so long as the function F is continuous, right? So what is it saying? Basically, it's saying that like, you know, if you've got an interval a, b here, let's say a is here, and then b is here, um, so that we can use it to the end of like what we want to do with this question. Let's say that f of a is right here, right? f of a being the y value associated to a, obviously, and f of b, let's say, is like right here. So this is b f of b. So this is f of b. Then the intermediate value theorem says this. Well. Okay, so your function is continuous, meaning it doesn't have a jump or a break. Then as you go from f of a to f of b, you must achieve every y value between f of a and f of b. Specifically, there must be a c, let's say c is right here, between a and b so that f of c is between f of a and f of b. Okay, again, however you slice it, all you're saying is that every y value from f of a uh, to f of b has to be covered by some x inside of a and b. Well, of course, f of a and f of b covering for their respective y values, right? Okay, well, that in that, in that order. Okay, 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 cool, we get this. And so, <laughs> the water level analogy is like, Let's say that sea level is the x-axis, you're below sea level, and then you're at the top of a mountain, you had to have broken sea level at some point. Okay, okay, all right. So how does this apply in this specific problem? Well, you see, what we're asked to show is that uh, two sine x is equal to uh, three minus two x uh, in the interval zero to one. Uh, so 
uh, we can turn it into a statement about equaling zero. Specifically, we can write this given equation as an equivalent form is 2 sine x and then plus 2x and then minus 3 equals zero. Ah, okay, cool. So we're saying that this here crosses the x-axis at some point between zero and one. Hmm. All right, well, since zero and one are the only two x's that we're given here, let's check out what f of zero is, where f is this function now, right? f of x is two sine x plus two x minus three. So let's do f of zero. Uh, let me do this in blue. We have enough black on this board right now. So let's do f of zero. f of zero would be two sine of zero plus two times zero minus three. Well, that's equal to negative three because sine of zero is zero and that's that. And then what's f of one? Well, f of one is equal to two times sine of one and then plus two times one minus three. That says two sine of one and then uh, minus uh, one because it's plus two minus three, so minus one. So, so long as two sine of one is more than one, we can say that this is positive. But is that the case? Because, well, if that's the case, we're golden. We can prove that this is true by showing that this has to be zero, somewhere between uh, zero and one, right? That is like, if we can show that f of one is positive, we already showed f of zero is negative, we're saying we have to cross the x-axis at some point and saying this has to be true so long as f of zero is negative and we show that this here is positive. Okay, so the only task that remains then is to show that two sine x is more than one. Ah, that's why I have this handy, right? Okay, cool. Now, um, let's say that this is pi over two, right? Uh, there are a few ways you could go about showing two sine of one is more than one, but I like this approach. I came up with it and I like it. So, <laughs> so here it goes. Which is like, well, a pi over two, we know that sine is equal to one, right? Okay, cool. Now, I want to estimate sine of one. That's the whole point, right? Sine of one. Now, pi over two is clearly more than one because pi is 3.14. So if pi is 3.14, pi over two, is roughly approximately what half of that so what would half of that be like uh, 1.6 right like right 3.2 would have been um, 1.6 so 1.6 is a slight over approximation but that's all I wanted like roughly so then pi over 4 would have to be roughly 0.8 what does this have to do with anything well I know that now uh, pi over 4 is less than 1 is less than obviously pi over 2 and I know sine of pi over 2 is 1. What is sine of pi over 4? Well, that's for the 45, 45, 90 degree triangle, right? So that's 1, 1, root 2. So sine of pi over 4 is 1 over root 2 or root 2 over 2. So I see that sine of pi over 4 has to be less than sine of 1, which has to be less than uh, sine of pi over 2 or 1 right okay so i'll write one there now what is sine of pi over four i just said it it's root two over two where should i write uh well i'll write over here so sine of pi over four is root two over two because it's one over root two but that can be written as root two over two so that is less than sine of one which is less than one right okay cool sign of anything is less than or equal to one so that part was easy easy okay anyway 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 now if you're a nerd like me you'd know the values of root two root three and root five because they're like well they'll come up a lot in your math life root two is about uh, 1.41 root 3 is about 1.73 and root 5 is about 2.23 so I just said root 2 is about 1.41 so half of that is about 0 0.7 so 0 0.7 is less than sine of 1 is less than 1 now we want 2 sine of 1 so I'm gonna multiply this inequality set of well trio of inequalities by 2 on all parts and what I'm gonna get is uh, 2 times um, 0 0.7 which is 1.4 is less than 2 sine 1 is less than 2 that doesn't say 21 it says 2 times 1 anyway 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 we just see that 2 sine of 1 is a number between 1.4 and 2 therefore 1.4 
to two, some number in there, minus one is gonna be greater than zero. Ah, wonderful. So we just saw that f of one is uh, below, uh, sorry, f of one is above the x-axis. So let's say uh, one is here. So uh, f of one is above the x-axis. And f of zero, where, where did we do it? Right here, is at negative three. So at some point on this function f, you have to equal zero, that is cross the x-axis. All right, got it. But if this is equal to zero, uh, subtracting two x from both sides and adding three to both sides of this, you show that this has to hold true. And of course, for a number between zero and one, guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this. Keep watching, take care.